Hi, good morning. Thanks for having me back at, at UK NOF. It's great to be here. I'm wearing my PeeringDB hat, actually, not my official work hat. I wanted to talk to you about PeeringDB 2.0, and I have a lot of slides and only a few minutes, and we're right before the coffee break. So we'll just focus more on the new features in 2.0, and then I'll just tell you a couple things about the organization update and the upcoming elections. So what is PeeringDB? This is the intro slide, probably not needed for this audience, but in case you haven't heard of PeeringDB, it is the database of peering information on the internet. Everyone here is probably registered. If you're not registered and you have an ASN, you should probably go register uh, quickly. We've relaxed the rules on registration. You used to have to do peering before you could register, but now anyone with an ASN can, can register. So PeeringDB 2.0 was launched on March 15th after, I guess, years of anticipation and, and uh, threats. Um, the backend database dump was discontinued, so there's no more legacy dumps. And there were uh, very few challenges during the launch, actually. Uh, the, the support team that, that rewrote the database did a great job. There were a few, few bug fixes and uh, lots and lots of support tickets. But other than that, it was a, a pretty smooth launch. And I broke these new slides down into uh, two new feature categories. There are some new infrastructure features that I'll tell you about on the back end, and then some new user features on the front end. And I have some more illustrative slides for those because they affect, affect you most. The PeeringDB 2.0 is a complete rewrite. So the back end runs in, on Python now. The front end uses HTML5. And you can see it even works on mobile devices. So that's a screenshot from my iPhone. Um, for some reason, I was looking at peering to be at one in the morning. I'm not sure why, but uh, I was. The schema is completely redesigned, so this gives us data validation in two forms. There's input validation on the IP address fields, uh, telephone fields, email address fields, things like that, which we couldn't do before. And then there's also validation actually within PeeringDB. So where possible, if there is an option to fill in something, we try and use that pre-validated data. For example, if you're peering at an exchange, you can only choose the ASN that you've entered as the ASN of that exchange. So people would enter random ASNs before, uh, which of course is incorrect. There's data versioning. This is really good because every change has a version in history, so it's very easy to roll back. It's also very easy to import old data. So we have some CADA dumps going back to 2010, which took about two weeks to import. It's not available yet, but that data is there, and the idea is that, that we can some, somehow um, provide historical data on peering and, and how it's changed over time. And then the other big thing, uh, which is on the infrastructure but also on the user side, is the API. So it's a RESTful API. It's, it's stateless. It allows for incremental database syncs, and there's also documentation and tools. So this was important to keep this stuff documented and to provide tools that you people can use to, uh, to sync the database. In terms of new user features, the most requested feature and probably the most painful one for admins was that before, facilities and exchange owners could not edit their own information. So the way to update it was that they would send us email and we would copy and paste it or we would typo it and then uh, they would have to send us a correction. It was very painful. So now everyone can own their own record. And this has been really valuable already for facilities and IXPs. We've had a lot of owners already own their own records and be able to update their information now. So that's great. Uh, you can now have multiple records of any type associated with an organization. So uh, many organizations, for example, might have a network and they own an exchange point or they have a data center facility or something like that that can all be managed under one record now. And you can also manage multiple organizations with a single account. So before, you had to create different logins for different organizations. That was kind of painful. The contact information is, has permissions now. So over the past, we've had uh, problems with uh, people harvesting data from PeeringDB and maybe spamming people. So that has caused some problems in the past. Now we have different permissions for the contact information, so you can really lock that down according to how you would like it. And as I mentioned before, we have APIs and the option to do a local database sync now. And I'll tell you how to do that in a couple of slides. OK, here's just examples illustrating all the new user features and, and how to, to click on all the things so that you get your data associated correctly. So we're in Manchester, so I, I chose IX Manchester as an example, which happens to be under links. So you can see that there is one organization, links. They have a data center facility. They have two networks. And then they also have six internet exchanges. So these are all associated under the same organization now. It was very easy to see what all they own. 
just by looking at their organization record. Here's an example of one account managing multiple organizations. So you open this case is associated with, with four different organizations. And if you wanted to affiliate with another organization, then it's very easy to do that. And I'll show you how to do that on the next slide. If you are an existing network operator, this probably doesn't apply to you. Network operators already had admin accounts. So if you had a network record in PeeringDB 1.0, that account was copied over to 2.0. But if you are an exchange point operator or a facility owner, then you will definitely want to do this. This is the way how you can request ownership of your records so that you can update and edit the information. So you just find the, the exchange point. In this case, it's my example X that I made up. And then there will be a little button that says request ownership. You click that, it generates a support ticket where it's validated. If you would like to request affiliation to an existing organization, then it's very easy to do. You just go to your profile. So step one, go to your profile under the little drop-down menu. Uh, two, make sure that you've confirmed your email address. If you haven't, then there will be a little button there that says verify or confirm email address. I've confirmed mine, so it says that. And then you just enter an ASN or organization number. If it's a new ASN, then it will generate a support ticket. If it's an existing one, it will do a search, an autocomplete, either on the ASN or the organization name, so it saves you a lot of typing. And then you just click Affiliate, and then, uh, as I mentioned, if it's a new organization, it generates a support ticket. If it's an existing organization, then it sends the request to the owner of the organization to authorize your account. And this is what it looks like. You can go to User Management, so if you're an admin on the, uh, on the account, you'll see this User Management panel. There are requests that you can approve or deny. In this case, there's no request. And there's also a way for you to change access levels for a user. This wasn't possible before. So you can either be an admin or a member. If you're a member, then you have the option to delegate specific permissions. And I'll show you that on the next slide. And you can also remove users from the organization. So that just removes the user account associated with the organization. It doesn't actually remove the account from PeeringDB. That can only be done by the PeeringDB admins. Here's a great example that Equinix happens to have. They did a lot of work with their permissions because they have a lot of different regions and networks and facilities that they administer. Uh, they set this up so that particular users only have access to particular things. So in this case, um, this, this first user, Equinix UK, can manage network records but no exchanges or any facilities. And the other user, Raphael, he can manage a particular network record but and also the exchanges and facilities. You have even sub-permissions that you can delegate under this. You have create, update, and delete. So you might want to have uh, particular users that can update or, uh, some information but not create or delete it. You might want to have um, users that, uh, you know, I don't know, you can use your imagination, but you have all these options to, to really delegate specific permissions to a particular user for a particular network exchange or uh, facility record. This is an example about the contact information. As I said before, we had problems with people spamming. So we have three different visibility preferences for each role. So the roles are listed there. So you have a number of different roles. Uh, private is anyone in the organization can see it. This is the default. Users is registered users can see the contact information. And then public is that anyone can see the contact information. So you might want to have uh, like a sales contact that is public to everyone and then a technical contact that is maybe um, you know, for registered users and then some other contact that only people in the organization can see. I don't know. So you can, you can use your imagination there on what to do. A little bit about the API. The API was really designed for automation, so that was kind of a key component of the API. And you can do anything with the automation that you can do through the web interface. So you can do read, create, update, and delete. The idea is that it doesn't matter what interface you use. You have all the same functionality available. Each object has an associated tag. So you have org, net, ix, and facility. There's a list of objects there and also the API documentation that you can go to. And this is what it looks like if you just use curl. You can get um, a particular, uh, the, like the whole list of networks, or if you just got a particular record, you can see that this output returns JSON formatted data that's according to the database schema. So it's really easy to, to use this interface to get the information in a particular format. There's also a local database sync. This is really useful if you want to have a local copy of PeeringDB. There's a couple things that you can do with it. Um, number one, it, it, you might have improved performance. 
Um, it doesn't rely on the appearing DB servers to be up or, or uh, available. You can build custom indexes and interfaces. This is really cool because you can add whatever fields you like. Um, if you don't like the colors of the web page, you can build your own interface. If you don't like the fields that are displayed, you can build your own interface. And you have a choice of database engines too. So the, the sync supports MySQL, Postgres, and SQLite. Netflix has contributed a Redis module to, to sync and Redis. Or you can just pr build your own tools or use the API. You could just pull particular fields from the database. You wouldn't even have to sync the whole database, just depending on what you're trying to do. There's two libraries that I'll tell you about. There's a Django library with the local database sync. This defines a schema that you need in order to create a local database copy. So it's easy for you to integrate this into whatever tools or framework that you're doing, and you can get it at this URL. And then there's also a Python client. This can get and display objects in either YAML or JSON format, or it gives you like a who is like display of the records. It also has a local database sync. And this is for integration into custom tools that you're building with Python. You can get the, uh, the tool here on GitHub, and Grizz also has some examples that he's provided. OK, that was about PeeringDB 2.0. I realize we're going fast, but we have 30 slides in, in 15 minutes. So I'll just tell you a little bit about the governance. Uh, it's now a nonprofit organization in the US. So that's important because it lets the organization do things like sign contracts and have bank accounts and things like that. There's two committees. There's the admin committee, which is currently full. This is the committee that works on all the support tickets. There's also a product development uh, committee. We're looking for people for this committee. If you're interested, this committee defines uh, what features are in PeeringDB. Now that PeeringDB has an organization, they can actually contract people to do things and provide a roadmap and write new features and things like that. Here's the admin committee. Um, I'm on the admin committee, so if you have any questions, I'm here all day today. Uh, here's the product development committee that's still forming, as I mentioned, so if you're interested, uh, get in touch. You can become a sponsor. Here's all the different levels. You get a logo display that you can put on your web page that says that you're a PeeringDB sponsor. And something cool that we did is you actually it shows a little badge by the organization or facility or exchange name if, if they're a sponsor. Here's the initial sponsors, so thanks to all the initial sponsors. Here's the elections. I grayed out all the stuff that doesn't apply it anymore about the nominations that are now closed. The point is that opening, uh, voting is open until the uh, end of April 29th, so if you haven't voted yet, please vote. Here's the board candidates. It's basically five existing candidates that are all on the board, and then Florian is one of the new candidates. Here's how to get in touch with us. There's mailing lists for announcements, governance, technical, and uh, discussion questions. We're on Twitter. We're on, on Facebook. If you have questions, you can get in touch with the board or the support staff. And this is a, a special announcement that we did at GPF last week uh, just to thank Richard Steenbergen, who was the initial creator of PeeringDB, and he's graciously donated that to the organization. So we gave him a little plaque, and I took a picture of him. So thanks to Richard, and that's it. Any questions on PeeringDB? Have you all used PeeringDB 2.0? Yes? Better. Better. Okay, that's good. That's good feedback. <laughs> we like to hear better. We like to hear up and to the right and better. Okay, quick reminder before the questions. Can the questioners please identify themselves and their affiliation? Yeah. I've got a question, Greg. Okay. Um, yeah. Nat Morris from Netflix. Uh, the new API is really good. Um, cool. We're, we're not putting uh, pairing DB internally into Redis anymore. We're putting it into Cassandra, but it's, it's all great. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I thought oh, it was... th That module still does Redis, but we'll okay. publish something soon that does Cassandra. Um, so okay. I have a couple of questions. Um, what's the rationale behind pairing DB not publishing the application as open source? I don't know. That's a good question to send I, to these lovely people. I think it make it on the stores a, list. I think it make everything a lot more transparent if, and. People feel a bit safer about it if, that, if the app itself was on GitHub. Yeah. Not necessarily your backend data because we can get that by the API to the app. Yeah, yeah. And I don't know. That's a, that's a really good question. Um, I expect because, so this goes a little bit into the history, um, which is maybe you know, a little extra. But basically, what happened is Raz wrote PeeringDB 1.0. Yeah. Um, it was done, I don't know, years and years ago, and the code was unmaintainable. And in the meantime, 
Matt Griswold started developing 2.0 with the intent that at some point PeeringDB would become an organization and they would get paid for their work. Um, so they contributed basically all the code for free and all their time for free, and I expect that has something to do with it not being open sourced. And um, will PeeringDB be publishing uh, some documents on how the data is backed up and such, and if what, are you guys sending offsite backups somewhere and all that kind of stuff? That's a good question. As far as I know, it's not, it's not, in, it's not backed up. Okay. Um, there are. I believe mean, there are a couple different servers that share the data, but yeah. uh, that's a good question. Um, let me let me find that I, one out. I have one last question. Yeah. Uh, would you consider some kind of sorry? <laughs> would you consider some kind of ripe esque uh, NTRM where you guys someone could open a socket and you just stream updates to them rather than me hitting your API every twenty minutes? I think all those things are possible. Any so basically, we have two point zero, which was released, and and C twenty is working on bug fixes to that. Any new features are done by the product development committee, so all those things will be tracked and prioritized and um, you know, implemented according to what PeeringDB can afford and how much it costs. So yeah, all those things are, are great to send to the product development committee because they're going to start tracking the new features. Will Hargrave from Lonap. Um, yeah, uh, I, th I agree with uh, Nat's point. Maybe we kind of need a disaster recovery plan for PeeringDB because now it has become quite useful. Um, yeah, I'm sure there is one. I just don't know it. I am. Um, maybe it's something to bring up in the member meeting, which is unfortunately today, right? Oh yeah, uh, I, I should have mentioned that um, when I talked about the elections. But there is a member meeting today. I think it's at four hour time. Yeah, I think so. Is that r that's oh, right? Or was it uh, five? So if you would like to, to sums are hard. <laughs> yeah, if you would like to dial into that, um, you can find the announcement on the uh, the PeeringDB announce archive in case you weren't on the list, or I think it maybe went to the governance list. Um, good, good point, Will. Greg, it's uh, Neil McKay from BT. Just th there's a lot of great things in PeeringDB about locations and stuff that, that's really helpful, but. How do we take this? And but it kind of feels like the same thing that we had 20 years ago. No disrespect to the guys involved in it. How do we evolve this so that you know maybe I can put, I can configure my policy into it. I can put a price tag on it. Yeah, you want to peer? Swipe your credit card. Um, you know, really kind of take the the almost the kind of fluff out of it so that you know. If, I mean, in Nokia, I'll, be, I'll pretend I'm a Nokia sales guy for a moment. I know you're not here as Nokia, but. This is kind of this could be a controller for peering in some respects, yeah. And and just take all the human component out of it, so we get things turned up, and also put more data. And oh, by the way, we're going to have this big event. We might need a little bit more bandwidth, and, and really take it that, that next step. Otherwise, it just feels like a whole bunch of people standing around the table exchanging post-it notes. Yeah, or I think you're right. I mean, essentially, PeeringDB 2.0 is 1.0, but better. Yeah. Um, there's no added functionality, but I think this also, and this is more a question for the board, and I'll just tell you my personal opinion, but I think p the intent is to be a database and not a marketplace. Um, I think if you start providing you know, marketplace information, I think that has a lot of implications on you know, the, the, the legal structure. Um, you know, and all, I mean, you can imagine the U.S. legal system, uh, but what you would get into... Bermuda's quite uh, close to the U.S. <laughs> yeah. Uh, um, but I think it just goes back to the intent that it's intended to be a database. Certainly there are requests for enhancements to add more of that kind of info to peering DB. But so, yeah, maybe, I mean, maybe not, maybe just some more stuff on policy then. So yeah. you meet my policy um, and, and it just bangs out some, some Yang thing and it's just done. Sure. And I've not to phone anyone or debug anything. Yeah. Or and and a, lot of, a lot of people are writing their tools and that's what I was saying about the API. You can use the API to do anything. Um, yeah. Some people use the API to generate router configurations based on the information in PeeringDB. Some people use the API to figure out who they're peering with and who they're not peering with based on you know, what's in PeeringDB for a particular exchange. So I think the idea is to provide a, tr a database and then let the, the, the users use it as, as they want and not build that functionality into the database. And I think my, my, just my final point is we need to do more to ensure that who's there and how they're reachable is some way verified because a lot of people, you know, it's just, and, and it's an impossible thing to do. But yeah. how, how, again, and it kind of, for me, it takes the, some of the, the human component out of it, which, and which is, 
I send a transaction, I get some sort of return. Um, yeah. And, and, and especially, you know, I quite often use Pure and DB when we've had a wacky DDoS going on or someone's tried to hijack it, you know, something. And it, and it is useful for that, but also it can be an actual really big pain in the ass because the data is just, you know, maybe our last updated, you know, 1964 sort of thing would be helpful. Yeah, the, the last updated, the created and last updated timestamps are in there for all the data. It's not displayed on the web page, but it is there if you use the API. But I think you, I think you have a good point about uh, what PeerNDB could evolve into and all those things uh, are more questions for the board and when where they see the direction going. But I think also the thing to keep in mind is is that PeerNDB is a, a small volunteer organization. So, uh, you know, that's why I would say the commercial applications, I think, should should be developed separately and maybe not within PeerNDB. And then, you know, that gives, that gives the market opportunity to decide what tools they want. Okay, one more question. Um, yeah, so that, that was actually a good follow-on. You've, you've almost sort of partly said what I was going to say, which is the API is there. It's now easy to build tools and services on top of that. So if you want a marketplace, if it's okay within the license of using the data, which is the question, what, what, what licensing, what, what, what restrictions are there around using the data from the I, API? I don't know if there even is a license, to be honest. Right, okay. Yeah, right. I think that's a good question. Yeah. Um, but I, th I think the, the, the argument about keeping peering DB fairly simple in terms of scope, because otherwise you get horrific scope drift, keeping it simple in terms of scope and then allowing people to build services on top of and tools on top of that is, it seems a sensible way yeah. to go. Yeah. I think that's a good question, though. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Greg. Okay, thanks.